I will now briefly uh, read the text to hear what what is the uh, what is the uh, foundation of, of the next hour. The essence of Christianity lies in a life centered in God and God's reign. This urges Christians to a greater role beyond the church, which again necessitates a constant rethinking and revisiting of our contemporary context. Public theology intersects multiple facets of life. Individual lives, societies, nations, the community of European nations. As a theologically informed public discourse about public issues, argued in ways that can be evaluated by publicly available warrants and criteria, it seeks to communicate how Christian faith and practices bear on public life and the common good. And in doing so, possibly move to action both by individuals and by the Christian community and beyond. So the question is really tonight uh, centering around what we sometimes term as public theology, the role of, of the church in society. So age old questions really, but with some new uh, terminology tossing here and there. The first question is, or the main question is, is there a role for ecumenical theology in transcending private, national and confessional concerns whilst contributing to public conversation and potentially action? So is there a role for, for theology in the public square, so to speak? Uh, something which is on the agenda of Keck and I think on the agenda of all 114 member churches of the Conference of European Churches. You get five minutes each uh, and then we will have moved well into the hour we have available and then we'll see what happens afterwards. Uh, can I ask uh, Dr. Robert Innes to, to begin? And after you, uh, I will ask uh, Archbishop Nikitas to be the second speaker. So, Robert, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much indeed, Jorgen. Thank you, and thank ah, you for the invitation. Christianity has known, uh, since its origins, a distinction between two different kinds of community. Early Christianity demystified the Roman Empire, thereby introducing a feature into European political life which has remained with us, the idea of two different kinds of corporate loyalty. There exists the ecclesial community on the one hand, and the political community on the other. Today, this relationship between church and state works itself out slightly differently in each modern European country. In the EU overall, it is mediated through Article 17 of the Lisbon Treaty, which provides for an open, transparent and regular dialogue between the EU institutions and churches. Karl Barth once described the church as an unreliable ally for each and every political system. In conversations with a political authority, there will always be the temptation for the church to form too close a relationship. It may do this to gain legitimacy and power, or because the state co-ops the church to the pursuit of its own ends. Immersion in the discipline of theology is vital for the church to stay true to its own distinctive calling and character. In modern ecumenical theology, the church understands itself as the sign, symbol and foretaste of the kingdom of God not as a well-meaning NGO, nor even as the spiritual arm of the social democratic movement. Theology calls the church back to its own native language, to liturgy and to prayer, to God, albeit that this language requires translation for the public realm. A secular political outlook tends to be concerned with functions and processes. Theology raises questions about ends and goals and ultimate concerns. Theology places our discourse in the widest imaginative context. So in regard to the environment, theology sees the world as God's good creation, having a sacramental quality, not as an inert domain for human beings to master and control. In regard to economics, a theologian will not ha uh, have an automatic skill in economic theory, but they will be able to ask questions about the purpose of economic growth. This wide perspective is important because and managerial politics that fails to ask the deeper questions can be really dangerous. At worst, you aren't concerned about whether the trains are going to Eden or Auschwitz, you're only worried about whether they run on time. 
The kind of theology that addresses the public world is best done ecumenically. And that is because it is in encountering people from other ecclesial traditions that we think most deeply about our own. An ecumenical encounter will yield a richer position or range of positions than is available from any one tradition by itself. Uh, Jonathan Chaplin has suggested that the purpose of a public or political theology is to help form practical Christian political wisdom. He suggests that a basic task of theology is to hold before government some fundamental principles such as render just judgment and advance the common good. Beyond that, theology can formulate middle level objectives such as the equal satisfaction of human needs or adhering to the rule of law. One particularly effective set of such principles in the UK context is the seven principles of public life drawn up by Lord Nolan as a guide for public officials. If we want a model for how this kind of theology is done, we could do hard, hardly do better than look to William Temple. Temple was a chairman of the Provisional World Council of Churches, Archbishop of Canterbury during the Second World War, and a leading contributor to both the faith and order and life and work streams of the young ecumenical movement. In 1942, he wrote Christianity and Social Order, a book which called for the provision of universal access to health care, education, decent housing, proper working conditions and democratic representation. This was a vision of a post-war society that reflected the innate dignity of each person created in the image of God. Temple's work led via William Beveridge to the creation of the UK's welfare state. Temple demonstrates eloquently that ecumenical public theology can be both deeply theologically, th deeply theological and wonderfully practical. Perhaps we need a new William Temple for today. Thank you very much, Bishop Roberts. That was uh, pretty much uh, five minutes on, on spot on. So I thank you for that, setting the precedence for the rest of the speakers, I guess. Uh, next in line is uh, His Eminence Archbishop Nikitas. If you will unmute yourself and after you, it will be uh, Reverend Dr. Heidi Zitting. Good evening to all of you, and I hope that you can hear me. I will be a little bit more practical, perhaps, in my thoughts and observations, which is, I think, very unusual for Orthodox Christians. We used to go into deep theology and speak theology and expressions. And while theology does talk about issues concerning life, public domain, the reality is that the recent problems of our world have forced us to develop an ecumenical theology. Communities that could not work together and never addressed issues together were forced to look at the world in a different way because we all suffered the crisis called coronavirus. We had to realize what we could do as communities and defend our faiths, our traditions, our expressions, sometimes coming into conflict with the government. Before, because the government wished to impose upon religious societies things that they could not accept, or I might say not understand. How could it be possible for the church to convene and the church to gather when the doors of the church were closed and the people could not come in? How would it be possible to continue the progress and the growth of the church when baptisms and full immersion were not allowed and on down the line? So we see that the events of society and the world have caused us countless problems, but they have forced us to come together and to look at the issues of life and see how we can respond as not individual communities, but ecumenical society and the community of faithful. For what could be true for one could be true for all of us. It forced us as Orthodox and I'm sure other communities to re-identify ourselves, if I can use that expression, to understand who we are in the world and how we relate to others. 
I looking at the questions in a more general sense and to see the positive but also the negative issues at hand. We have to be honest and realize that the war taking place at this time has forced us to come up with answers and to challenge people and even to question them. Who are you? Where is your Christianity? What are you saying? And even more important, what are you doing? Can a church bless weapons? Can a church move forward in war? Must we build new alliances and must we develop new theological expressions as communities? That's part of the negative. What is some of the positive? We're in the time of new religious leaders, children of those who were born from the first ecumenical families. Those children know one another and want to work with one another. Those children seem to use the same expressions. Our ghetto walls, if I might use that expression, have come tumbling down. We are no longer afraid of one another or afraid to dialogue. The other has not only become our ally, the other has become our friend. And friends can walk together with expressions and movements and meaning to challenge governments and even to challenge the world. The ecumenical leaders of today and tomorrow are giving us hope. They shattered the, the iconoclastic, or they are the, are the iconoclast of the problems of the past and want us to go forward and become one as a Christian world and as a Christian community, keeping our values, our identity, and yes, our individualism, but also our unity, so that there may be diversity, but unity if we look for a better world. Five minutes on the dot. <laughs> Thank you very much, and we keep the good timing. That's, that's very nice. Thank you, Your Eminence. Uh, we move on and say hello, uh, Tapiola. Good evening. Hello. Good evening. Uh, thank you for having me here in, in this panel too. Uh, I will address this question with some examples. First, uh, the war in Europe is now uh, the number one concern in many countries also here in Finland. Uh, it is in many ways a private concern uh, of individual persons. It is very much a national concern. And as well, we theologians know that this war is also a theological or even confessional concern. Ten days ago, there was a Europe Day celebrated also here in Finland. And on that day, three Finnish bishops from different confessional backgrounds, one Orthodox, one uh, Lutheran and one Roman Catholic, held a prayer session in front of the uh, Ro Roman Catholic Cathedral here in Helsinki. This cathedral is very conveniently placed just next to the embassy of Russia. Okay, so there was a prayer session for people from different faiths, uh, but what is interesting is that uh, this prayer session was followed by an event where the bishops gave very strict common voice in condemning the Russian actions in Ukraine. I quote, Russia's offensive war is a crime against international law and a sin against God. As churches, we strongly and univocally condemn the horrific actions and cruelties of Russian offensive army. The idea of peace and the idea of Europe belongs to them. End of quote. There were no coincidences. This prayer event, or should I say a demonstration, took place at the Europe Day and outside in public uh, in front of the Russian embassy. There is strong and concrete ecumenical contribution to 
public conversation and a way to channel private and public and confessional concerns. Uh, second, this, in this increasingly complex world in which people of different churches and nations live besides and with each other, churches and societies are confronted with many di dividing moral and ethical issues too. From ecumenical point of view, it looks like these moral and ethical issues no longer divide the churches from each other, but within the churches and within people in these societies. The question is that are these churches growing closer to each other, but less coherent in, within one confession? And if so, then perhaps some kind of reconciled diversity inside our churches and in our societies is also our common task. I believe that uh, our tradition of constructive dialogue could offer useful insights to pu public discourse. Uh, some ecumenical constructions such as the before mentioned reconciled diversity or recognition or the faith and order studied, study document quite recently, churches and moral discernment fa facilitating dialogue to build koinonia might turn out useful too. Furthermore, um, one useful ecumenical theological document which encourages churches to public action is the World Council of Churches document Gift of Being, called to be a church of all and for all, and was released 2016. This document has turned out to be a very useful tool, for instance, in our recent uh, General Synod of the Evangelical Lutheran Church of Finland. And in this meet meeting, we have discussed uh, on e equality and empowering the people with disabilities. Very biblical way of transforming the society. Thank you. Very much, uh, Dr. Heidi Zissing. Um, I, 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 I took note of one of the expressions you used a prayer demonstration. That's, that's an interesting one. I think we could return to that one later. Uh, next in line is uh, Dr. Angela Illich, and, and my official will have the last word in this first round of interventions. So Dr. Illich, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. And I would also like to thank you for inviting me. Um, I will speak from a slightly different point of view um, as a scholar of religious studies and as a historian who focuses primarily on Eastern and Southeastern Europe. Um, some of the issues that are facing us in Europe today have already been mentioned. And um, we have heard about the pandemic, we have heard about the war and the many um, consequences that it has on countries and churches throughout Europe. But we also have other crises, other issues facing and impacting all of us, including the environmental crisis, which is not going to go away, including the issue of migration from the Middle East, from Asia, from Africa, that continues um, in, the, in the direction of Europe, and many other issues that are worldwide um, happening. These affect nations and churches in Europe in very different ways. We see them reflected um, on a daily basis in very different ways. Um, and so the challenge is, I think, is not allowing these issues to slip away from the center of discussion. Even as churches and as we speak about public theology, I think that is one of the challenges that we are facing today. Which, which crisis do we focus on? right now. And, and I think that is really an important point um, to keep in mind, not letting these issues slip away and prioritizing them in some way, but allowing them to keep to be to be remaining in the center of attention. Um, and I think it is really a crucial time because of that for public theology, for ecumenical theology. I live in Germany, which of course um, has a very large number of people for whom it is a private concern, an everyday concern. Those living in confessionally, uh, confessionally mixed marriages and families, it is a private concern. It is also a national concern and it is difficult to move away 
uh, from some of these and, and to move beyond them. I recognize that. Um, but if there is anything um, that I have learned as a historian uh, looking at religious history is, is the danger of churches, religious communities allowing themselves to be instrumentalized for political purposes. And we see this happening also very much today in many of the countries um, in Europe, um, there are obviously several examples, um, uh, even in Central Europe, um, in democracies or so-called democracies. Um, and it is difficult for churches sometimes to say no to certain things and to represent a dissenting opinion, especially when state funding depends on it. Yeah, for their work, whether it's charitative, charity work or um, uh, school work or whatever else they do. So I recognize these, these challenges and some will always say, well, ecumenical theology, there's too little yeah, of it. Uh, the agreements are, are, are simply not enough. Others will say, well, it's too much. You are agreeing too much and you are somehow entering into um, a situation where you must compromise. Um, but I believe finding this, um, finding this um, balance somehow is, um, is very important. So I will, I will yeah, underline it one more time. I think it is a crucial time for being able to contribute to some of the Europe-wide conversations for churches that are taking, um, taking part right now. And it is a way also of showing unity and solidarity with each other while recognizing that diversity of opinions and the diversity of convictions and of biblical interpretations and of practice remains. But somehow standing together and recognizing this diversity, but still showing unity. And I think that is a very crucial role of ecumenical theology at this point in time. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ilich. That was uh, another five minutes uh, on the spot um, intervention. You were very disciplined uh, this evening, uh, as will be uh, Mayo Fischer, of course, also with five minutes. Please, Mayo. Okay. Dear sisters and brothers, thank you very much indeed for the invitation to this meeting. Since time is restricted, just two preliminary remarks. And, and then I will focus on one main issue, the public theology, as theology of diaspora. So firstly, I was asked to speak as the General Secretary of the CPCE. So if I speak about ecumenical theology, I speak about the processes and the theological work that has been done within the Leuenberg Church Fellowship, nowadays the Communion of Protestant Churches in Europe. And secondly, regarding national and confessional concerns that were asked in or addressed in our question, <laughs> um, Protestant churches are part of the game. So in many contexts in Protestant churches in Europe, especially in Southeastern Europe, confession and nationality are interconnected in a way that confession can become an identity marker for respecting national belongings. From the very beginning and in, and in accordance with its nature, the reformation and hence the evolution of the Protestant churches were strongly influenced by the general political and social development as well. It was important to the reformers that everyone should be able to hear and understand the gospel in their own languages. Thus, on the one hand, the reformation and the development of the language and culture of the people were linked from the very beginning. Churches came into existence, which were at home in peoples and cultures and vice versa. Peoples and cultures were influenced by the churches. On the other hand, the reformation was a movement which transcended borders and countries and especially in country, territories where the Reformation was persecuted, people had strong international networks. And so I come to the main issue, theology of diaspora. In 2018, the 8th General Assembly of the CPCE received a document called Theology of Diaspora, a CPCE docu study document to define the situation of Protestant churches in a pluralist, pluralist Europe. This document reflects the actual difficulties of minority situations while bringing out the opportunities and strength of diaspora. From minority churches, we can learn about what may soon affect all the churches in Europe. How can Christian life in diaspora be shaped by a spirit of hope? What are their, what are their strengths and what is their mission? 
Diaspora means being scattered and sown like seed. Something that has been scattered is present in many contexts and at many places that may even be hard and hostile. Consequently, the concept of diaspora developed in this document is one in which life in diaspora means shaping fullness of relationships in the spirit of Christian discipleship. Christian minority churches cannot rely on privileges and therefore they need partners. They have a very rich network of relationships internationally with other churches of their confession, nationally with other minorities, locally with other stakeholders in society. Through these relationships, churches can mediate in political and cultural co conflicts. They can seek understanding for other national perspectives and thereby contribute to peace. This way, minority churches become places for building different kinds of bridges between Eastern and Western Europe, between parties to conflict, between Christians and non-Christians. Christian minority churches face the challenge of constantly reshaping their own, in our case, Protestant profile, in relation with the society in which they live. Their mission in the world is not just to react to societal processes, but to contribute actively to them. This is based on the insight that the churches, regardless of whether they are in a majority or minority, are part of societal give and take and keep up this interaction. Hence, a theology of diaspora inevitably has the structure of public theology. Accordingly, all Protestant churches and congregations also have a responsibility for society and should participate in, so in social and political debates. And I think also other churches as well. The study process on the theology of diaspora comes to the conclusion that a renewal of the concept of Protestant diaspora opens up significant opportunities. What minority churches already practice is something majority churches often still need to learn. Diaspora means being called to shape fullness of relationships while following Jesus. Our own church becomes part of a more comprehensive community with common roots. And that strengthens the solidarity and bonds among the different churches. This way, the concept of diaspora can contribute to renewing Protestant identity, Christian identity, and ecumenical openness. Openness for a church that understands itself to have been strewn into the multifarious seedbeds of our world. Thank you. Thank you, Mario. This, I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm, I'm astonished by the discipline that we have experienced tonight with you of keeping your time within five minutes. It means that you can expect that we will invite you for other webinars. Uh, <laughs> we were kind of testing you out tonight, and uh, I think you all five came up quite well. So uh, expect to be, uh, to be heard in, in, in more uh, ecumenical uh, webinars in, in, the, in the weeks, months, and years to come. Uh, congratulations on that. I, I think we can, after the five interventions here, I think we can conclude, or we could say this is a subtotal before we uh, draw the final conclusions in like 20 minutes or so. Uh, we can conclude that there is indeed a role for ecumenical theology in contributing to public, public conversations. I think that has been the message of all of you. Uh, uh, and I think that's important to take away from this webinar, that, that there, is a, there is agreement here. Um, and I think, uh, Dr. Elit, you, you said that you used the old uh, ecumenical uh, phrasing that we, we should recognize diversity but stand in unity. Uh, we've heard that before. So I, I would open the question. <clears throat> I think we would all agree that we should indeed recognize diversity but stand in unity. But the question is, of course, how do we do this? We know that people have different opinions on, on, on political matters. So how do we, as uh, now speaking of ecumenical theology, how do we, uh, how do we in the best possible way uh, communicate a, a united message to our European societies? Are we really, could be the next question, are we really establishing that there is a role for ecumenical theology in, in, uh, in, public, in a public conversation. But the next question obviously must be, uh, is, is ecumenical theology capable of transcending private, national and confessional concerns? Uh, 
I think we tried to do this for for many years uh, in the ecumenical movement, but have we succeeded? Uh, and how do we do this best? Is this via the more traditional ecumenical organizations like the World Council of Churches, uh, Conference of European Churches, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Uh, or is it is it done in different ways? A few words from each one of you on, on that question. How do how do we? It's an easy one. How do we overcome our adversities? It, it shouldn't be too complicated. Um, in the best possible ways, if we look forward, how do we become this united voice? Just a few words, maybe also reflecting on what you've heard your colleagues saying tonight. Uh, and then I hope we will have like a 10 minutes uh, at the end of the webinar for for maybe two or three comments from uh, from the audience here in Brussels from the governing board of the Conference of European Churches. We will go by the same, uh, 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 yeah, we will go start with, with uh, Bishop Robert again and then go through the same uh, line of speakers. So just a, a few comments on, on my question and uh, reflecting some of the words that you've heard from, from your colleagues. Robert, please. Yes, um, I mean, Jorgen, you make a very good point. And one of the frustrations with with those of us who, who've been involved with Keck over a few years is it has been difficult sometimes to uh, to get a sufficiently well focused address to the public realm because much energy has been taken up in establishing common positions amongst the uh, 170 uh, member churches. Um, however, uh, when we look at some of the really big issues that have been mentioned th uh, this evening, uh, COVID the war in Ukraine, the environment, migration. Actually, those really big issues, I think we, we, we can quite quickly get a common theological position on. So if we, if we are to focus on those, rather than, let's say, some of the, the more contentious subjects, which are actually of less interest to the public world anyway, I think we would, we would do better, stand a better chance of being heard. Thank you, Bishop Robert. Uh, uh, Your Eminence, uh, Archbishop Nikitas, your, your considerations on this one? Yeah, I, I realize that we do have common positions, but we also are very diverse in our opinions concerning COVID and the Eucharist, for example. How could a government forbid us from that central element of our worship? I went to battle with public health, England as did many Orthodox throughout the world with other governments. But I think there's a very serious problem in ecumenical theology, dialogue, and whatever. We don't even really know each other. We come together for Zoom meetings or assemblies or that, and we don't even know each other on the local level. So in two weeks, I decided to gather my youngest clergy, and an equal number of non-Orthodox younger clergy. Because we don't have female clergy, so I invited female theologians on my part. So we can begin to know one another, Anglican, Catholic, Pentecostal, and do things to shock my people, a black gospel choir singing in the Greek Orthodox Cathedral of London. So I think we need shock therapy, and I'll stop with that. <laughs> well, I can only say from here, uh, the governing board uh, convening physically for the first time in two and a half years, uh, we, can, we recommend getting together in this way. It is really a blessing. Uh, so, sorry to tell you who are on the screen right now, but, but this is really good <laughs> to sit together, to enjoy a meal, to have a coffee together, uh, and to strike all the little deals and the breaks. That's also great, I think. Um, anyway, Dr. Heidi sitting. Uh, will you will you share with us your thoughts in a few in a few sentences? Thank you. Um, first of all, I would I would like to say that I agree with with Bishop Robert that that some topics are much easier to address together than the other ones, and and I think that with the with the extremely difficult ethical questions, uh, I have started to think that uh, as as we have found diversity within our churches, within our own denominations, perhaps after that, when we have somehow been able to to solve uh, this this problem of diverse uh, opinions on ethical questions within our own uh, own churches, then it would be easier to overcome the diversity of of other 
uh, other uh, denominations too. And, and in this way, uh, the diversity that it has been growing inside our churches might even uh, turn out to be a gift in the end. Thank you so much. So again, speaking for, uh, for getting to know one another locally, really, and to address some of the differences that we see in our local con constituencies. Uh, Dr. Angela Ilic, a few thoughts from you? Yes, um, I, obviously I'm very well aware of the intricacies and the difficulties that are involved in trying to come to common positions, but I think within that context, maybe we do need to think about the possibility that on some issues we will not be reaching consensus. We cannot reach perhaps consensus at this time. But I think that's when what you Archbishop Nikitas have said, the, the importance of knowing each other and of getting to know each other at a deeper level. And I'm very happy to hear about this initiative. I also know of many very similar ones uh, throughout Europe that are taking place. I, I consider that to be absolutely key because I think when we get to know each other across these national and confessional differences, then we can say, yes, we are siblings in Christ. And yes, we may disagree, but we still stand together and we still can stand for each other. And I think that is one of the keys. Thank you so much. Before I give the word to Mario Fischer, I will uh, let the uh, governing board members in this, uh, this venue just indicate whilst Mario is speaking, whilst still attentively listening to what he's saying, of course, indicate uh, if you would like to uh, comment or if you have a question. I will take note of, of who wants to speak. Um, Mario, please. Yeah. When it comes to ethical discernment or articulating a public position on social developments, still a lot of churches try to work on these topics just on their national in their national context or also in their own denomination. And I think we have to realize that we don't have the resources and the also on the diversity of different opinions in our national context. We have to discuss these issues in the on a global level or especially for in our context on the European mm -hmm. level. It's an, an another question um, whether all these issues have to be also addressed on the European level or whether we should help and support the member churches then to articulate this public position in their respecting um, so context. That's I think another question but and in this way I think we have both sides. We need a, a level for discussion, a level for reflection that, and that has, this has to be the European level. And on the other side, um, we need to help our member church to raise the voice of Christian, Christianity in their particular context. Yeah, thank you. So uh, uh, an exchange between the international level and the local level is really what I hear many of you saying here. I got one uh, request for, uh, uh, for for a voice from here. It's uh, Aina Kiva, representing uh, IKD today at the uh, governing board meeting. And I, if you're trying to speak, Aina, let's see if, if there's a microphone somewhere picking you up. <laughs> uh, yeah, hopefully it works. Good evening, and, and thank you very much for all your comments. <laughs> Thank you very much for all your comments and it's good to have you here with us, although it would be much much better if you were here present in presence. Um, my question uh, is um, and my comment and my question is um, on on the contribution of Mario Fischer and and, and, and and what he said about the diaspora churches and and, and the public theology. And my question is, because we are sort of siblings or sister organizations, uh, what does CPCE uh, offer in order to encourage and enable churches to fulfill this, uh, to, to fulfill this special mandate uh, in the diaspora, in, 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 uh, in, 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 the, in the framework of public theology? So what can you offer? I hope my question was clear. Mario, and if anyone else uh, in the panel would like to reflect on this question also, you obviously you're welcome. So to Rainer Kiefer, yes. just to request, um, is it what we can offer to the member churches or, or what we can offer to CAC? 
To the member churches. To the member churches. But if you have anything to offer to Cape Mahi, you're both welcome. <laughs> but this concept was, I mean, I, I, we speak human resources, money, whatever. Uh, yeah, so re yeah, regarding CAC or concerning CAC, when Jürgen and I we speak about this, we normally speak about the question that CPCE could be a kind of sidekick to CAC in this way. But um, when it comes to the um, member churches, um, it's clear we have our advisory board on, on ethical issues and we try to um, prepare um, orientation aids or material for every six years. We have a, a big material. So we had um, the document on ethics of reproductive, reproductive medicine or also the ethics of the end of concerning the end of the life. And now we had also the um, document on um, the questions mm -hmm. concerning the churches of, with the pandemic. So it's clear that with our resources, we are just looking what we can offer to the churches. And it's mostly that we bring the European horizon and the horizon of different churches, especially from minority churches as well, which have normally not the resources to um, reflect it in their own context. So I think that's mostly, and I hope that also majority churches can benefit from this, um, especially if it comes to very creative models in a situation when majority churches often speak more about structural approaches. Thank you, Milo. I was a bit cheeky uh, about your contribution to CAC a few moments ago. I have to say in this forum that I enjoy uh, Mayo's advice uh, very much. We are almost in weekly contact at the moment, so that's, I appreciate that a lot, Mayo, so thank you so much. Uh, Anna Skelko from the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Denmark, who has published on public theology recently. I think there's a comment or a question coming up. Hello, thank you for giving me the floor. I would like to ask a question that is related mostly to what you, uh, Bishop Robert Lewis, said. But I, I don't mind if you, some of you others would, would respond to it. I like very much your, your uh, uh, talking about the, the difference of policy and public theology, where you describe policy as mostly concerned about the processes and uh, making compromises and finding solutions, of course. And whereas the public theology should be concerned about purposes, meaning, serving justice, and so on. So I, I, I think that we cannot necessarily among ourselves as Christians in Europe agree on solutions but we might be able to agree a lot on our concerns. So perhaps public theology should be more concerned about that. What are, what are the intentions with what we are doing uh, instead, of, instead of looking so much into the solutions? And perhaps there we could have a common public voice. That is how I understand you. Uh, would you please elaborate on that? Yes, I completely, uh, I completely agree. I, I mean, we hold out a vision of human life. And, um, um, you know, it has been said that a culture which loses its, you know, a, a, a nation which loses its religion will soon lose its culture. And, and I think in Europe, we, we are losing this vision of what it is to have a good and fulfilled human life, a good and fulfilled human society. And, and that is something we can, a vision we can continue to hold up before. Uh, our political leaders and, and in the public realm. And um, our, um, these questions of purpose, you know, what, what is economic growth for? You know, how much economic growth do we need? Uh, what is, why, you know, do we, are we living to work or, or working to live? And, and uh, as, as, as CAC together, we can continue to articulate these these bigger and broader issues, which stretch the imagination of the politicians, um, and and hold them to account on a broader canvas. Thank you very much, uh, Bishop Robert. Um, yeah, a, a last question or comment from Klaus uh, van der Kamp from the Protestant Church in the Netherlands. 
That would be the last one for tonight. Oh, yes, yeah, so you will have the last word, kind of, before someone responds to you, of course. Uh, I refer to, uh, I think Angela Illich spoke about that, about the danger that uh, speaking in public from a religion, that you might uh, abuse religion, and that you speak with the word of God, but only trying to emphasize your own meaning. So, would it be a good idea that there are at least two starting points first uh, for speaking in public? First is that you try to give voice and empowerment to those people who are in need. And the second uh, 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 thing is that you also ask the question how you can change yourself uh, and how you can uh, have a, uh, contribute to a solution by yourself in order to, uh, to, 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 uh, to avoid the situation that you are arrogant and that you have uh, uh, an, 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 a sort of a character like uh, I already have the truth and you can try to get it. So that uh, the prophecy and that uh, uh, the self-reflection is starting point of all public speech. Dr. Illich, you will have the proper last word now, I think. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, yes, of course, I, I very much agree with you. And I, I think that yeah, that would be very important to actually start with self-reflection and, and a healthy amount of self-criticism. But I think when, when I'm speaking about this, we see this tendency, particularly in Central and Southeastern Europe, in countries that stood under socialism, where, as we all know, religion of any form in public life was severely limited when not outright persecuted. So churches are now, and religious communities in general, are often receiving maybe receiving back those privileges that they once had and they finally after 40 50 however many years have a voice in society and so it, it I think it is very difficult in that situation when on the other hand they see the opportunity to, to finally be able to be doing these things in public and influence ver various um, fields of, of society um, <clears throat> to be to be self-reflective enough. I think that is a that is yeah some kind of a um, yeah it's a temptation to forget about that um, in that situation and especially if you have um, if you have governments that are also using very much religiously oriented public discourse in their rhetoric and they're kind of co-opting uh, not only church language but language but also the churches themselves as institutions and allow them to take over uh, different sectors and different um, um, different yeah, types of work in society, um, then yeah, then it is very difficult in that situation. And I think that is what we're seeing right now in many of these countries is that some of this self-reflection, some of this self-criticism, some of this looking at those who are actually in need um, kind of disappearing. And I'm not saying it's not there. We see again and again very positive examples of that, of people um, from the church hierarchy walking or living or literally spending time face to face with these people in need. And I think those are extremely strong, positive statements with a great symbolic value. But in general, I still see this danger of uh, co-optation happening in many countries today. Thank you very much, Dr. Ilic. Uh, I think we need to draw to a close now. 60 minutes is not a lot. We have to uh, admit that. But I think we, we came across quite a few questions and we actually managed to, to answer the main question of the evening, to say, is there a role for ecumenical theology in the public discourse? The answer was yes already 20 minutes ago. I think it still is a yes. Uh, the second question, whether we are able to uh, promote a Christian voice or the Christian voice in Europe. Uh, I guess that question is still open. Uh, but I think what has been said at the end of, of, of this webinar, that self-reflection is important. I think that is really important. I think self-reflection was always a, a crucial part of, of ecumenism, really. Uh, I think we all have experiences where we've met 
someone who is different from us and it has opened new ways of looking at ourselves. So self-reflection is, is an important outcome of, uh, of humanism. And I, we, if we could teach that to some of our decision makers, uh, some of our politicians, I think we've come a long way, really. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, all five of you. Thank you for the people who were uh, asking questions and giving comments tonight. Thank you, Bishop Robert. Uh, uh, Dr. Heidi Zizing, uh, Dr. Angela Illich, and Mario Fischer from CPCE. Thank you very much again for, for being available with so short a notice. Uh, it's possible because of the wonderful virtual means that we have available. If something good came out of, of the COVID crisis, maybe it is that we all become a little bit better, although we still have technical issues, apparently, uh, we become a little bit better in using this kind of, of tool in what we do. Thank you so much and have a very good evening wherever you are. We will now go to the bar. That I was talking. <laughs> um, thank you.